performance, strangely enough. Um, <laughs> so tonight's talk is web performance is not a technical problem, uh, owed to Peter. Ah, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a trolley kind of headline. There's quite a lot of uh, technical uh, stuff to talk about. Um, this is part one, isn't it? Present this. Let's test the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Not done a presentation from slides.com. Ain't probably before. If this works well, it's a great advert. If not, don't use it. Um, how do you full screen in here? I'm on, a, I'm on a Windows machine for the first time in, in years. F11. F11, thanks, God. Oh, you have F keys in Windows. Brilliant. That doesn't seem to have done anything. <laughs> Sorry, Andrew. Thank you. Sorry. I'm a technical lead. <laughs> I'm a technical lead on a Mac here. Yeah. Um, I've got a clicker, great. Um, we're endorsed by Steve Sauer. He did the last talk here, uh, and he was very kind. He came and saw us. We gave him the effect of the BBC News checkbook and pen, which is the BBC News mug, and he tweeted a photo of himself. So I'm basically like totally endorsed by by Sauer. So good, good, good stuff there. Um, this is our website. Uh, I, I guess everyone, most people in the room, are familiar with the site. Um, in general. Um, the Responsive News as a project has been to transform the site from what it was um, back in 2008, eight, nine. I think, probably I wasn't there then, um, a site on SSIs, um, SSI in includes type, a really old school, what we probably think is an old school technology now. Um, uh, and it's taken probably since about 2011, I think, um, the project's been going on. Uh, I wasn't there for the duration of it. Uh, but since I've worked there, probably about two years now, coming up to two years, um, it's been one of those places you go in and you feel that you're standing on the shoulders of, of giants. Um, and that's quite serious. I mean, quite seriously, it really does feel um, uh, uh, like we're sort of following in the footsteps and have a responsibility to some really, really clever people. Um, but I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of... Uh, where are we? Hang on. Where's the down on here? No, that wasn't it. <laughs> Technical lead, everybody. Press. B. B. Oh, wow. Cool. I think I'm running into problems with the clicker not having the right orientation for this slide deck. Um, a lot of people don't realize that we also have um, another 31 websites globally in 27 different languages, um, all actually come built off the same code base. So, here you've got Mundo, Latin American News, Uzbek. Uzbek's an interesting case. Uh, in Uzbekistan, you've got Cyrillic, Arabic, uh, and Latin script. So that site works right to left, left to right in whatever you want it to work in. Uh, and two variations of the Chinese, simplified and traditional, on the same site as well. So there's some interesting challenges there. Burmese is one of my favorite uh, ones. Um, Burma weren't really involved in the W3C when they were under the rule of a military hunter. Um, so there never really was a proper Burmese font stack in browsers. So we have our own font we rolled for Burmese, which you ship in there. There's a whole talk in that. It's very interesting. Right to the left there, obviously Arabic. Uh, and I think at the bottom there, the Viet site as well. So we've really um, got a lot of complexity around um, the product uh, in terms of different languages we support. It's much wider and bigger than just the one site that we're probably most familiar with. Um, I think, again, standing on the shoulders of giants, we're very known for being quite innovative. Um, historically, as a project, this is a shot from Dave Blumen, who was tested for very many years in our senior dev and our frameworks team, um, get all the devices out. And we're one of the first places, I think, to be doing this kind of uh, uh, getting all the devices out, doing responsive web design, sort of hopefully the proper way it's supposed to be done. And along the way, we managed to do some cool stuff like Cutting the mustard, which have become things that people elsewhere in the industry have um, also adopted themselves. Uh, I think uh, uh, Patrick Hammond's here. I, I know it's something that they did at the Guardian. We we're very, very proud of having people like him have gone out and actually take, made this a good thing. People who don't know, it's a sort of JavaScript heuristic, really. Um, uh, you just check a few um, properties on the uh, document or the window object in, uh, in the page. Uh, and that tells you really, well, we use it to decide really whether we can serve a an advanced-ish JavaScript page is a modern-ish browser, uh, or do we serve it a core experience and not enhance the page? That helps us to cut out that massive long tail and, and fat tail of, of really low-powered devices for the users we're interested in in sort of remote regions of the world on 
crappy connections that aren't really going to be capable of rendering pages. So that's an interesting technique. Um, and there are some other things as well along the way. I think, again, oh, one. Um, image of JS is an interesting one. Probably not like a massively the best thing in the world now, but at the time, maybe two, three years ago, um, when it looked like uh, the native implementations of responsive images weren't going to go anywhere, or hang on, they still aren't really anywhere, um, image, image of JS was a real um, step forward for us, uh, which uh, lazily helps us lazily load images in. Uh, and lastly, but not least, uh, Wraith, if you're interested in testing responsive sites, is great. Uh, it does a, it'll take screenshots across a whole load of different um, breakpoints, page widths, et cetera, using phantom JS, and then give you visual diffs of them, which saves your testers about a million years in, in, in time for them. Um, March this year, we got the site live to uh, all users worldwide, um, which is great. The World Service team had rolled out all these uh, responsive sites, these other 31 sites, and the main BBC News site became the responsive site. We chose the quietest day we could with a mere, I think we had something like 500,000 concurrent users at the time we switched over. So um, it's quite difficult to predict when it's going to be a busy day in the news, but that was kind of average, I guess. Um, and thankfully, it went well, because if it hadn't gone well, it would have been really, really difficult when this happened <laughs> a few weeks later, um, because uh, we, none of the election stuff we'd done was going to work on the old static site. Um, on that day, I think we did something like 30 or 40 million unique browsers in the UK. Um, one stage, we had 2 million concurrents on the site. So we were pretty um, pleased that the site stood up to that kind of level of abuse from the general public. Uh, um, I, you, know, you can't uh, not show off you won a prize. We got this cool prize from the .NET people um, in their awards ceremony of Team of the Year 2015, which is awarded to the team who write the best bot for gaming their site. Um, uh, it was a performance talk. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the stuff the team were doing uh, towards the beginning of the project uh, and set up a sort of um, the base principles that, that they were developing the site on. Tom Masman's very uh, that's <laughs> quite academic. I was like, moving swiftly, Masman 2012, it reminds me of university. Um, but, um, Tom Masman, obviously, in, in our team, is a very influential guy. He's been there since day one. And, and back in 2012, he gave this talk, Moving Swiftly. And he talks about, I think, I don't know if it was one of the first times I was talking about cutting the mustard publicly, this kind of way of just putting this line in the sand between kind of all good browsers and all the rest. Progressive enhancements with Ajax, only downloading what you're going to use, make the page usable as early as possible, uh, avoiding DOM redraws. They're, I think, probably for most of the people in this room, fairly known quantity things to do. Um, and actually, part of what I'm going to do tonight is think about whether that stands up today as a good way to build a website. I'm going to spoiler it a little bit by saying, yeah, I think that's a pretty good list of ways to, to start with a performant front-end responsive design. But a lot has happened um, since uh, within our team and within the project. At that time, there's uh, um, it was a mobile site, a mobile team working to replace what at the time was a kind of glorified WAP site, which the BBC had as its mobile site. Um, but as we grew, you know, as, the, as the business became aware that this was the next BBC news site, um, a whole load of organizational stuff starts to happen. You get to talk about, you know, you need the, the desktop view has this kind of special place. But I think a lot of people relate to this. If you're an organization doing responsive design, your stakeholders tend to care a huge amount about your desktop and your sidebar and all of that sort of stuff. And you've got this amazing little core, mobile, optimized, responsive site. Uh, and then you're starting to talk about desktop parity and your heart breaks a little bit uh, and about shipping all these features from your SSI site over to your brand new responsive site. Um, rolling out to these sites I've already talked about, like 27 languages, that's a huge thing to do. The World Service team did huge amounts of work on that. Um, introducing advertising, some one of the uh, guys here was talking before about how it must be difficult internationally with advertising. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> because for international visitors on the site, it's the same code base. You get ads in the UK, you don't. In fact, in, we'll talk about this more later, but if in the UK we show you ads, there is a lot of shouting. Um, uh, and two navigation strategies. I think partly a, 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 partly a UX thing, a business thing. We hadn't really um, dealt with the fact that there was an expectation about navigation in the wide view that, that really wasn't uh, synonymous with, uh, with, with, the, with the nav we had in our view. Um, so there were other things, organizational complexity, uh, development across both code bases. So there was features that we were asked to develop across both the old static site and the new one. That was pain. I'd recommend not doing that. 
um, and some page, page components we didn't um, fully control. Um, so when we came to launch the site in March this year, we'd actually sort of had our head down doing a lot of delivery for a phase for maybe 80 months. Um, strangely coinciding with one hours at the BBC, it's almost like I came in and I stopped doing like the really like cool stuff. And, we, and we'd like, yeah, we want to ship this and make it the site. We were very proud that we got this out there and we made it the site. Um, but we did know then that we had compromised some of our principles, probably. Um, uh, and we did know that we needed to get visibility of that. Uh, so we undertook a performance audit. Joseph's going to talk a bit uh, more about that now. Hello. Hello. There you go. Uh oh. <clears throat> okay. Um, so before I take a dive into the performance audit that we've done, I just want to make a couple of quick points, kind of expand on something that Pete's already touched on. But the responsive news product is a really big thing. Um, globally, including all the worldwide sites, not just domestic, um, we do on average about 38, 40 million unique users every day. And on a kind of average day, uh, we'll get half a million concurrent users. And as Pete said already, this will jump to a million on a, a really busy day. It'll jump to two million on something like the um, general elections or the Paris attacks. And it's, it's the number one place that people in the UK go for news online. It's actually overall one of the most popular websites in the UK, I think in the top 10, but I've been told not to give any solid numbers on that. Um, and it's one of the most popular in the world overall as well, in any category as well as in news. So I'm not really talking about that because I wanna brag or blow my own trumpet or anything like that. I'm, I'm saying all this because when you get an audience as large, as global, as diverse as BBC News, what you end up with is a bunch of people all around the world trying to connect to your website on new but crappy Android devices, uh, old underpowered laptops, and you know people on slow, unreliable 3D connections. So this is an example of a user, what a user sees if they were to load the BBC News website from Bangalore in India on a real 3G connection. Um, these are the people for who performance really, really matters. So for these people, the performance of your website is kind of the difference between looking at some content on the news site or staring at your phone for a minute at a white screen and then kind of giving up. Um, the thing is, this is the view from the same place on the same connection um, of the Guardian front page. The reason I'm showing you this is because it's really easy to kind of blame a slow website on poor connection speeds, on bad devices. Um, but actually, a lot of performance has to do with the implementation on your site itself. And for The Guardian to have something like this, for The Guardian to have their page rendering in three seconds uh, from India on a 3G connection is, is amazing. And I think they've done a, a fantastic job with that. So basically, Earlier this year, um, a bunch of people in the BBC News development teams kind of raised their hands and they were like, is our site as fast as it can be, as it should be? And one of those people was me after I took a trip to rural Scotland to see my mum and you know, I wanted to catch up on the news, load up the BBC News website and actually Chrome gave up after 60 seconds um, and didn't render a single thing and I didn't get to read the news that day. Um, <laughs> There are a couple of other red flags that came up. One of them was, um, I don't know if you know this, but Internet Explorer, maybe eight or nine and below, has a selector limit in your CSS, something like 4,096. And if you go over the selector limit, i.e. will just refuse to recognize those styles, and uh, you miss out a bunch of styles. And we hit that. Um, our CSS was so big that Internet Explorer just refused to render a whole bunch of uh, the page. Um, and it's kind of it's images like this that go around the department, and they really get people thinking that if we're rendering 
this much slower than the competition. And this timeline is actually from a, a DSL connection in the US. So this isn't like this isn't a slow 3D connection or anything. It gets it gets people realizing that we need to start making a difference. Um, but the important part is that a bunch of people got together and decided that something needed to be done. So obviously, the first thing you need to do when you realize that is go to the business and convince them that actually this is something worth investing time in. Um, images like the one before really help with that to show that we're behind. And images like this help as well. So this is showing um, the page load time, the further across here you get, the longer the page is taking to load. And the line is the bounce rate. Um, so this is a direct correlation between how fast your website is and how likely people are to leave without going on to a different page. And the other thing that's really useful for convincing the business is um, creating little videos like this. So I, I like to send this around occasionally just to remind people that there's, um, there's still a little bit of work to be, to be done. So yeah, eventually, after sending that video around enough, we were we were given the go-ahead to do this performance audit, this thing that I want to tell you guys about. Um, the business wanted us to make the page faster, the whole site faster, but what they needed was uh, a bunch of recommendations and basically an estimate of how much effort it was going to be to implement all of those. Um, if you've done any performance work in the past, you might you might identify with me when this is like the really nerve-wracking part because. This is the part where if you misidentify issues, if you start spending a bunch of time fixing things that don't actually have a big impact, um, you completely lose the trust of the business. And that makes it really hard to justify continuing to do performance work now, but also to do performance work in the future. So for us, the development team, it was super, super important that we could have confidence in the, uh, what we were identifying was going to make a real measurable difference to the website once we spent the effort on it. <clears throat> um, so basically what we did was we looked at a bunch of waterfall graphs like this one. Um, you can get one of these in your browser dev tools. You can get it using something like web page test. Um, but these are really useful for getting a, a kind of top level view of what's going on when the page is loading. So just in case, I'm hoping most people here are familiar with it, but just in case you're not, web page test, um, it lets you load up a page in a real browser from anywhere in the world, really. Like, there's a bunch of people who donate their servers for this. Um, and it gives you some tools like throttling the connection to emulate 3G. You can record those nice videos to show the business. Uh, and you can even script some interaction with the page if you want to get really deep down. So the stuff we were looking for. Um, things like this. What's probably not obvious to you, but was to us, is the browser here is prefetching a bunch of assets, uh, which aren't actually used on the page um, until very far down. So the browser is taking up these connection slots, which should be used for things like uh, our JavaScript, our styles. Um, so that was a, a red flag for us. We're also looking for stuff like JavaScript here, which is blocking the page from rendering for a long time. But essentially, we were iterating on this until we had a long list of things that we thought we could look at fixing. So this is where we had a bit of fun. Um, once we had this big list of things we thought we could fix, we did a bit of multivariate testing. Um, and all this means is that we took a snapshot of the BBC News front page, and then we created a bunch of variations on that. So these variations were kind of um, handwritten fixes for things. For example, taking all the image tags from below what we thought the fold was, and throwing them out, cutting and pasting some JavaScript so it runs further down, and these kind of things. Um, and the reason this was really useful for us is because it lets us look at the, the fixes um, in isolation and kind of test the hypotheses that we had um, from looking at these waterfall graphs. And it also means that it's quite trivial to combine any of the fixes to see if they have a, a better or a, a lesser effect when they're combined. Um, and we went back to web page test. We ran these through loads of different scenarios from places all around the world on different connections and just got 
as much data as we could around um, the effect that we thought they were going to have. Um, the only thing worth mentioning here is that we did make some conscious decisions around things like uh, always using Chrome, always making sure the connection was artificially throttled. Um, and it's just stuff like this that kind of helps you get a solid baseline. So there are a fewer variables when you're running the tests. Um, so I'm just going to go over some of the interesting ones, or some of the stuff that we thought was maybe unique to the BBC. Um, but this first one actually requires that I go off on a, a kind of a bit of a tangent. So hopefully you're aware that most people in the UK um, pay for this thing called a television license. I don't know if anyone has a television. Um, and the, the money from this license goes towards funding part of the BBC. And because we get money from the public, there are a bunch of things that we kind of must and must not do. Um, and one of these things is that absolutely, under no circumstances, should anyone in the UK see advertising on any BBC product. Um, the thing responsible for doing this on our website is a bit of JavaScript called the fig, which is going to come up a lot during this talk. Um, but all the fig really is is a little settings object that other components on the page kind of use to determine what they should do. For example, if you are in the UK, the fig tells the ad renderer not to render some ads. Um, most of this is really simple. Like the, the logic around that is done using geolocation, so figuring out where the user is based on their IP address. Um, and I think for a long time, this is kind of how it just worked. We, we just said, if you're in the UK, don't show your ads. And I think this worked for ages until um, several years ago now, Virgin Trains announced that they were going to provide Wi-Fi on their services. And we started getting reports that people were seeing ads on the BBC News website while they were on Virgin Trains. Um, I think this kind of stumped everyone for a bit. But it turns out that when you're on the Virgin Trains Wi-Fi, I don't know if this is still true, all the traffic was being routed to some company in Europe. I think the Netherlands, maybe? So the FIG was doing its job. It was like, you're in the Netherlands. We're going to show you some ads. <laughs> but this was a huge no-no. Like This is breaking one of the kind of core tenants of the BBC, like the, the trust of the audience. Um, but basically, since then, the FIG has had this like protected status. Like If, if you want to do anything with the FIG, you don't do anything with the fig because we don't want to show anyone ads. Anyway, the, the fig is a blocking piece of JavaScript in the head tag. Um, and it's over SSL as well. So for a lot of users, especially on the other side of the world, it can block rendering for like a couple of seconds. And we basically wanted to see what happens if you yak it up. Um, predictably, the page render time comes down quite a bit. Um, this timeline makes it look much better than it was, because actually a side effect was that you don't get ads when you don't get the fig. Um, but it, it had a good effect. Um, so this one, I actually had a lot of fun with. If you haven't already heard of it, I recommend checking out this thing called UnCSS. So it's a, a tool which, given a web page, will open it up in a headless browser. And then it will filter through your style sheets and remove all of the styles that aren't actually used on the page. So when I ran this through uh, my snapshot of the BBC News front page, we managed to get the CSS down from one megabyte, which I mean, is nuts to begin with, to um, 60 kilobytes of JavaScript. Um, <laughs> and needless to say, this, this had like a, a huge impact on the, uh, on the page render time. I think on lower end devices, it has an even bigger impact. There are probably some people that know more about this than me, but I'd, I'm guessing the reason it has such a big impact is because either the browser is spending a, a load of time either computing the CSS object model or applying that model to the render tree. I'm, I'm not really sure, but either way, it was, uh, it was pretty crazy to see the results. So to keep with the theme of, um, of not using things that you don't need, we went ahead and removed uh, about two thirds of the JavaScript which we had on the page, uh, which just wasn't being executed anywhere. So this took our bundle from, I think, 300 kilobytes down to about 100. Um, and this actually didn't have a huge effect, which was kind of counterintuitive to me. I think, I think there's still this stigma around um, JavaScript and around including loads of JavaScript on the page that you don't need, especially when you talk about frameworks, which I, I don't really want to get into. Um, 
but I guess modern browsers are just good enough to kind of not really care if you give them a bunch of JavaScript that you don't need. <coughs> um, okay, so Pete kind of mentioned earlier that if you're outside of the UK, you should see ads. Um, and this is actually one of the uh, biggest performance issues we've had for people outside of the UK, especially on the other side of the world, Australasia, Asia. Um, the team who handle ads did this testing. I think they, they were doing this for about a year and a half before we'd even started looking at performance. But essentially, the blue line here is the page load time with the synchronous ads. And the orange line is when they implemented some asynchronous ad loading. Um, the increase was amazing. These are just synthetic tests, actually, but um, there was a 40% reduction in the page load time. So um, I think Singapore is the example at the top. Went from something like 18 seconds down to 12 um, for the page to be fully loaded. Right. So we kind of we had this list of stuff which we thought we could fix, and we thought we tested it enough that we could go ahead and make a, an impact to the site. Um, and then we got to this part where we need to put our money where our mouth is. Um, and actually deliver some sort of value to the business. Um, and we did. We've rolled out a few things so far, which I'm just going to go through. Although first, um, I think it's worth mentioning a tool that we've been using. So this, this is a screenshot of a thing called Impulse. Um, I don't know how well known it is. I hadn't heard of it until six months ago or something. Um, essentially, it's a real user monitoring tool, um, and it gives you a lot of customization to dive deep into some metrics like um, the typical stuff, load time, bounce rate, session length. Uh, and you can create your own metrics with the user timing API or just by inserting some values as a global JavaScript variable. Um, I, I can't do this tool justice in like a, a 20 or 30 seconds feel. But basically, this is what we were using to not only validate the stuff we were doing, but create dashboards like this to give to the business so that it was visible for them. OK. Um, so the <coughs> synthetic testing that we did around asynchronous ads, uh, we thought that was great. And we went ahead and rolled that out, I think, the beginning of last month. Um, this graph here is for users in Australia and New Zealand. Um, the average user kind of saw like a one percent, uh, sorry, a one second reduction in the load time and the render time, um, and then you've got all the other users who would normally see like a twenty or thirty second load time, and that had a bigger effect. I think that was up to like ten seconds that um, they had shaved off their time. Um, probably more importantly, though, we saw at the same time as the load time drop an increase in metrics like uh, session length, number of pages per session. So these were really positive things to give back to the business. Like, look, you've invested this time into making the adverts better, and people are looking at your site more. Um, I think this one's kind of interesting, because actually everything except for the first page load is already behind the CDN. Um, but what this meant was that like, if a user in Australia requests bbc.com slash news, they're actually making a request all the way back to our centers in London. I'm waiting for that to come all the way back to them, which means that the browser can't even go ahead and prefetch things for like two seconds in some cases. So we invested in Fastly, I think, um, put a bunch of edge nodes around Asia, Australasia. And now I think you get the initial response back in kind of 200, 300 milliseconds, whereas it was as high as two seconds before. So that was um, that was pretty good. If you if you look at the BBC News site regularly, hopefully you won't, but you might notice that the images have been lazy loading for a couple of weeks now. Um, so this is essentially, we load the first image in, and then as soon as you scroll far enough, we decide that we want to load the images that are in your viewport. Um, <coughs> and this one didn't have any measurable impact on load time, but actually it's really important for users on uh, mobile data connections. Um, so. On a wide view like this, we saw reductions of like three to 400 kilobytes in page weight overall. And on mobile, it was around 200 kilobytes. So that's another thing that's measurable. And you can say, we're saving our users money. They're not downloading as much image. 
Um, and this is another weird one because it's only actually affecting, uh, affecting one request on our site, but this goes back to the fig. Um, and in the same way that users would have to go all the way back to London to get the initial page load, we're also making them go all the way back to London for this fig.js. So um, the browser would go ahead and wait two seconds for the initial page load. It would start trying to render stuff and get stuck on the script. And it would be waiting you know, like two to four seconds for this to get back. Um, basically, the reason it had to go back to London is because we were doing the TLS termination for the HTTPS connection um, in London. But now it happens at the edge. Um, so that was just another small thing that's kind of helped bring the, the render time down a couple of seconds. And that's making a, a really noticeable impact for users on the other side of the world. So that's basically all the, uh, all the good stuff so far. Um, I think we've done pretty well in making improvements for global users, uh, but maybe not so many noticeable improvements for domestic users in the UK and around Europe. Um, so those timelines showing us versus the Guardian, the video showing us versus the Guardian, that, that still applies. Like, we still need to do a lot of work in that regard. Um, but I think something that became really obvious when we started doing this is that retroactively trying to apply performance fixes when you're five years into a project's life cycle is really, really hard. Um, some things are organizationally hard. So that's stuff like convincing the ads team that they should make some changes and potentially lose revenue. Uh, some things are hard in the sense that they're expensive. So getting a CDN for people on the other side of the world, you pay, I don't know, thousands of pounds a month for that kind of thing. Um, and some things are just technically hard. Like we've got five years worth of CSS that's kind of been building up and there's a megabyte of it and we've got no idea how to unravel it and make it better. Um, one of those things, one of the technically hard things um, is that we still load about 700 kilobytes of JavaScript on a page um, and there are about 23 HTTP requests to get all of those. But actually this is organizationally hard as well because um, as I discovered last week, 21 of those requests uh, come from other teams at the BBC. Um, and I think 450 kilobytes come from those other teams as well. So essentially, we've got a whole bunch of, we've got this long road ahead of us where we've got to work with all these teams that, I mean, I haven't even met yet uh, to figure out how we can get their JavaScript either optimized or you know, just removed from our pages. Um, and like I said, we've still got a load of CSS that isn't used. Um, I think we currently force you to download maybe 10 times as much CSS as you actually require. So I'm sorry about that, but you know, like legacy code and all that kind of stuff. This number did used to be a megabyte, I think I said earlier. So we've, we've kind of chopped some of it off, but it's hard. Um, and this is something we identified quite early on as well. So one of the important metrics we wanted to affect was not just the, the time for the page to be fully loaded, but actually the time at which you start rendering the page. So we want that person in Bangalore, even if they don't see all the images, the full content, we want them to see something you know, within a couple of seconds. Um, and this critical path, CSS, um, I think is a technique which is fairly well known. Essentially, you identify the CSS which helps you render the layout, the title, uh, the article content, you know, the important stuff. And you yank that out of the star sheets and you inline it at the top of the page. And that just helps the browser kind of kick off the rendering as soon as possible. Um, I think there's some talk about doing this, but again, it's just one of those like, don't talk about that legacy code kind of things. So this is the part where I uh, preached the choir a little bit about technical debt. Um, essentially, if you want to make really big changes, um, especially around performance, quite far into a, a website's uh, life cycle, things get pretty, pretty <coughs> hairy, um, and they get quite expensive as well in terms of developer time and you know, buying CDNs and that kind of stuff. Um, but I guess hindsight's 2020. So what we're trying to focus on now and what Pete's going to talk about in a sec is we want to fix as much as we can now. And then we want to make sure that we never get in this position again. So some of the stuff Pete's going to talk about is where we're going to from here. Feedback. 
There we go. Went back on. Thanks, Jason. Um, where did I end up? Oh dear. Back in the uh, back in the land of the machine, I can't operate. Let's go. Oh, exit full screen. That's what F11 is for. Uh, let's go with this one. Is that that? Yes. Learning on the job. Um, so yeah, I'm going to pick up from what Joseph has been talking about, but also I, I just want to re revisit for a minute um, the principles from the start that we were talking about um, around uh, core content, uh, single blocking requests on the server side, cutting the mustard, JavaScript AJAX uh, enhancement, um, laser loading images, obviously something that Joseph's shown is something that works for us. Um, those were good things to do. And actually, in terms of that part of the code base, the, the dev bit of the code base, um, there are really valuable things to do. <clears throat> a couple of things we did that didn't work out so well. Um, being clever about trying to load CSS via JavaScript for the right media, for the current media query. So we only just got quite obsessed with the page weight. Andy Davis is just like, oh my god, <laughs> tell me why, Andy? Is it because I'm delaying uh, the, the the time to first content by preventing the browser from prefetching? Many, many things. Uh, and read paints. So, so, so actually, some of the um, things that we were trying to do uh, a few years ago, uh, if you weren't careful about how you implemented that advice, they're internally contradictory because you're saying only give the user exactly what they're going to need. Yeah, we did that. But we failed to do some of the other things we were trying to do, um, like getting the content as quickly as possible. And um, I'm thinking of Patrick Hammond's 1,000 milliseconds, uh, breaking user 1,000 milliseconds talk. Uh, get the CSS in front of you know, down as soon as possible, right? So that's just a take home uh, from uh, talk back to the ages ago. But that, that's a that's a killer one. Um, so that, you know, so what I've written here, that's an example of an uninformed optimization, right? Uh, we didn't know that we we didn't know that that wasn't working because we weren't actually looking at whether it was working or not. We weren't really measuring it. And sometimes you're doing things to target one particular KPI, and it might target that KPI, but maybe it's the wrong KPI, and you're actually being counterproductive somewhere else where you need that value uh, more. But ultimately, you, know, you look back at the things that we were trying to do with the responsive news website in those days, um, and they're really a very good set of advice, because um, the things that really hurt, says so on the wrong slide again, are the elephants in the room. And we didn't deal with some of the things that are outside our control and they're the things that, that were the major performance issues uh, for us in the end. And in fact, these eclipsed other issues you've seen from Joseph's teardown. You know, this advertising issue globally, your guy in Bangalore on 30, 30, uh, 3G uh, connection waiting 40 seconds for a page, you know, blocking requests, WebPerf 101, advertising synchronous, WebPerf 101. Okay, so all of the stuff, we were developing this stuff within our zone as a dev team making this product. But we weren't actually managing to affect stuff at an organizational level, pan BBC level, that was actually what was going to sort of write off a lot of the good work that we were doing. Um, and then uh, technical debt. And again, as Joseph said, um, the things that we're looking at now, once we've hit the low hanging fruit of that audit, you know, and yeah. You know, Blocking scripts, low hanging fruit. The fig JS thing we're talking about, the Virgin Trains incident. Um, that's not so low hanging fruit. That's just quite like a ridiculously difficult thing you never want to have to deal with. Um, but um, having all this bloated CSS, bloated JS, um, they're hard to fix. But they're not hard to fix because they're technically difficult to do. They're hard to fix because they take a long time, and no one wants to go and look at a megabytes worth of CSS and re-architect how you load that into your page. Um, so if you're not getting those things right first time, and you're not seeing them not scale. Um, with your architecture um, at the time and fixing it then, uh, then it becomes quite painful in the long term. Which brings me on to the sort of uh, crux of the issue, <laughs> uh, performance not being a technical problem. Um, I'm glad Andy Davis is here um, because um, he's one of the reasons why performance is not a technical problem. Um, uh, you've got other people around probably in this room who've, who've contributed to the community of WebPerf people. Um, who have made it possible for people like me and Joseph to go out and use web page test and solve our technical problems. Right? That's not a problem for us to solve. We know how to fix things. 
Um, web page test speaker of Impulse. Again, I think Christian Skoll from Impulse is here, which is probably why Joseph gave it such a big plug. Hi, Christian. Um, <laughs> love your product. Um, uh, those tools are ready to go the moment you want to solve performance problems with your site. Okay, that kind of audit could be done by anyone. I mean, with BBC is a big website, but all of those things are just things with websites. So the web page is a web page. But you can't have it unless your organization wants it. That's the fundamental thing that we found. Um, as, a, as a team, we wanted performance. We did things that we knew were going to be performant and we thought we were going to be performant. But actually, um, the organization has the last word on what you can and can't do um, uh, around things. So we've been looking at um, how we in our organization can um, stop being reactive performance people. You know, we've had this phase, which has been successful to, to, to quite a good extent, um, where we've reacted to bad performance. Um, uh, we want to see how we can make um, it performance something that just sort of lives for a long time with us. So I guess these are the things we're doing now, or have done. Uh, making the case is obviously the first thing you need to do if you find yourself in the position we're in. Um, get the tools. Sometimes they're expensive, and sometimes it's difficult to get the money from the business to do that. Sometimes they're free. Sometimes you web page test, free. Dev tools, free. Um, learn how to use them. <coughs> the absolute gold to this is identifying KPIs that mean something to your business. You know, page weight isn't something that really matters to your business. Um, number of kilobytes downloaded, business guy doesn't care. If you can tell him that people are bouncing from the site because the page is slow, he cares about that. He cares, you know. um, similarly, um, if you can show them that the Guardian's website is twice as quick and they're a news editor, um, they get really upset. Um, so do that. Compare yourself to the competition um, uh, and make it something that the, that the product buys into through being directly correlated to their bottom line KPIs. In our case, that's often not money because of the BBC, but there are drivers. Um, and a huge part of that is raising awareness, um, making your dashboards visible. So tools like we've got graphs printed out by our stand-up board that have a nice, it's a great one from when we did the async advertising and uh, page load overall um, connected to time to first scroll, which is a metric we put into Empulse. So that's when the user first scrolls the page, the first scroll event we catch. Um, and I think... Um, Time to first content, so the first, basically time to what we call time to first headline, and these lines are all going squiggling along together, and they're all subject to this to the to the performance of the synchronous ad servers. You async the ad servers, and you suddenly get these lovely stable and much lower lines for time to first scroll and time to first headline, and and the, the page loads continues to to jump around like crazy. And hey, it doesn't matter because the user is actually getting the content now two or three seconds, five seconds faster. Um, so having those things, but not only knowing that, but printing it out and putting it on the wall and putting the marks on it and you know, talking about it with the team, talking about it outside the team. Encourage performance champions, not just within your team, like guys you work with, you know, Joseph or Bogdan or here, or, uh, you know, the guys you work with, but, but maybe a UX designer is a potential performance champion because UX have a huge part of your, Steve Souders talked about last time at Webper, um, uh, and the stuff that Speaker have been looking at in terms of um, the whole page load is, is, is user experience, right? You start getting your user experience team to understand that and to start have a dialogue with you and have access to these tools. Um, then you make performance part of the everyday conversation. Um, proactivity. So we're talking about re being reactive. <clears throat> there is a limit on how much you can go back and fix later on, not because it's a technical problem. We've established it's not a technical problem, but because organizationally, you, know, you take BBC... No, our product guys have other things that we've got roadmaps. We've got like Q1 2016 to worry about and, and other such things. We work in a business. Um, I'm sure you'll see spreadsheets with Q, this, that, and the other one. But um, um, so we've got, there are things we, the business are expecting us to deliver and we've got deadlines and stuff. And we suddenly go, hey, we've got a megabyte of CSS. We just need six, just six weeks to sort it out or just a month or so. Even just a fortnight to sort it out, the business is, is going to, it's going to be really tough to do. So when you find yourself with that problem, you've got to, You've got to be proactive. You've got to um, make sure that you don't have those sorts of problems cropping up again, as Joseph said. You know, our job now, what we're working on doing, is making the BBC a place 
that doesn't have a cupboard where their <laughs> stuff's growing kilobyte after kilobyte. You know, just one more wafer thin piece of CSS uh, going in. And it happens. We do a lot of elections, right? For elections, we always want to make cool new graphs and have cool new logos and cool new this and cool new that. And like, you just put a little bit more in. And if your architecture doesn't scale right for it, hey, you get hit. Um, so you build that culture around um, that cultural uh, uh, around performance. And then you've got a chance, we hope, um, to uh, not hit these problems again. So I'm standing here saying this um, as someone who's doing it right now. Um, and I found that the guys that we've had, I mean, we have a unique problem because we, because we have this kind of sandwich of the page that we actually control, right? BBC News, little white bar at the top that you've got a footer at the bottom. Uh, we control the middle of this, we, we have the ham in the sandwich, right, of, of, of that uh, page. So as Joseph was saying, there's all sorts of teams all over the place. And I'm sure that doesn't apply to a lot of people in this room, but there probably are, you know, um, ad sales teams and UX teams and God knows what else um, that are there to be to be bought in. And I've just been sort of surprised that people want to fix this stuff. But it's a case of reaching out and it's a case of reaching out um, in the context of the people you're talking to. So understand their KPIs, understand what they're trying to get out. Um, and what their boss cares about them delivering, um, and, and factor in um, what you need to get out of performance into what they can do. And that's an organizational thing. So I guess that's, that's where I finish. Um, uh, performance isn't a technical problem. Use the tools that some of the guys in this room have made for you. Um, organizationally, bridge um, from uh, talking about page weight to those KPIs get the monitoring and the visibility. I think without that, you're flying blind. I think if, you're not, if you don't have run monitoring graphs in real time, I don't think there's very much you can, uh, you can do long term. But if you do that, make the effort, I think you can build a culture that will uh, stop you hitting the problems that we hit. Um, and come and work with us. If you're uh, the kind of person who comes to London Web Perth, um, I'd love to have you on my team. That'd be great. Um, that's my tweet tag. That's Joseph Swan. Um, and we've got a careers website, the BBC. Um, quite a friendly bunch. If you like working on these sorts of problems, um, we'll keep you busy. Thanks. Thank you very much. We've got time for some questions. Anyone want to ask some questions? Hi. Hi, thanks very much for a really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned a bit about the specific metrics you're using right now. Yeah. How do you decide on those and how can you be, like, be relatively sure that within the next couple of years there won't be the... That's the a good thing? question. It, so, sorry, just to yeah, say, is that you, how, how embedded is user research in, in that process? Oh, that's a good question. And user research in terms of the metrics for um, what the business wants to get out of the website or in terms of what we or what what kind of performance matters the most oh in terms of user research that's a good question i i don't get involved in user research so we probably need to do more of it um we have a user experience team who spend a lot of time working with users around designs and proposals for the site so I, something that i'm trying to do at the moment is what i'm succeeding to do is have conversations with our UX designers, I just touched on it there, that, that once you start to talk about the user experience of the page um, being from the second the user clicks the link to go to the page, right, like the 40 seconds before you get that on your phone in Bangalore, right, that's user experience too. Um, uh, that, that does change the conversation somewhat. Um, but I'm not sure I can really answer that, um, actually about, uh, around how we use user research. If you've got any recommendations, come find me and Joseph. I think um, just on choosing the metrics, if I'm really honest, we, we took some wild guesses. Um, and I think the way you know if a metric is good or not is if it moves when you make a change, which you know is good. Mm -hmm. So if, if you've picked a metric um, and it doesn't move after the page load drops by seven seconds, it's probably the wrong metric. Um, or maybe your users just don't care about how fast your website is, but probably the former. <laughs> That's a great answer. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh. Andy. Sorry, I'm going to ask you a bit of a crappy question. Go. Sure. So 
it's great. We do comparisons for our customers against their competitors all the time. And, you know, you've obviously got the Guardian to compete against from Patrick and Co's work when they left. Yeah, yeah. Who would you choose to compete against if you were faster than Guardian? How would you approach that with your stakeholders? That's a very, very good point. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I would love to have that problem. <laughs> good Lord, give me that problem. It's Patrick Hammond here, actually. He's here. Patrick, who do you compare yourself to? <laughs> <laughs> um, just going back to the metrics which is i think that that question is, is completely contextual to your business right? yeah and so when i was at the guardian i had competitors so for me for us it was the nyt and not the bbc news not because we didn't want to be faster than you, it was because the NYT is the Guardian's main competitor in that yeah. space. Whereas you, <clears throat> because your public service is very different for you, yeah. yes, because the British public, the other largest news organization is the Guardian, that's where they get their news from. Um, that's good for you to have that competition. And so I don't think, to answer Andy's question for you, I don't really think that you actually have any others, and you shouldn't really. It should be specific to the needs of your business and to the content that you're delivering. So. Here at the FT, my I fortunately my competitors are not my ex colleagues at the Guardian. They are the Wall Street Journal's and the Bloomberg's in the world, and that's yeah. because our our customers here are paying for the, for the content elsewhere, and we want them to come to us. And yeah. so we need to be the fastest um, business news website in the world, which we are achieving to do with um, our, our new product. Come and work with us. We're hiring. If you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, but that leads me on specifically. My next question was going to be back to the, the custom metrics, which we kind of slightly touched on there. Yeah, yeah. And you said you kind of chose them in the dark, and if they moved. But what I'm more interested is in: Did you choose any metrics? So I'm really interested to hear you said first scroll. Um, did you choose any metrics specific to your business need? Which is another shift that we're seeing in performance at the moment is, uh, you know, page paint or page load is a fallacy. It, the metrics that you measure should be specific to your business needs, and so. Yeah something that I've been trying to think about a bit here in the teams here. So we started thinking of like for our homepage, it's time to first click because actually we want them to click through to another article. Absolutely right, did, yeah. did you come up with any custom metrics specific to your business needs? Um, so I think metrics is something we're constantly talking about. I mean, you, you can't just kind of pick some metrics and be like, these are the things we want to affect uh, always and forever until they're uh, the best they can be. Um, I think that there's things for the BBC like, uh, I mean, it definitely applies to news, but maybe also for iPlayer is the time it takes for a user to click play on a video. Um, you know, the time it takes a user to get to the bottom of an article, this kind of thing. Um, I, I don't have any solid answers for stuff that's really specific for the BBC, but I mean, we are always thinking about new metrics yeah. to record. So I'd, I'd reflect on that. The, the first scroll is actually our first step on that road, is it, as it were. I think we, we when we first, Talked about that metric. That's why I spoke about, uh, about it with John Philippe, actually. Um, I was a little bit like, well, that's actually just when the user like, actually scrolls a page. That's not like a hard bit of data. Well, actually, it is a hard bit of data because over 30 million users, like when, when they could scroll the page is when the page became something they could move about. And it tells you a lot about their experience with the page. So those kinds of metrics, as Joseph was saying, are something that we're developing our use of now. But I think, you know, as you've seen, We've had quite a lot of retroactive work to do, so um, we've been kind of concentrating on getting the Web Perf 101 stuff as, as tidy as we can. Um, first, I want to go, well, I will go back to Andy's question though, because um, if it was the fastest website in the world, I've just been able to visualize it now, uh, thinking about the direction we're heading at the BBC, it won't be long. Um, uh, you go, but there are, it's not just that, you know, looking at competitors, it is about, and I think it's almost the looking at competitors thing is fun, um, but the, the main thing is about. Um, getting your business KPIs, the things that, you know, you, we have goals, for example, World Service have a goal to reach 500 million users globally by 2022. So I mean, it's one of those kind of really strategic goals that the, the Director General will go and say at, at election. Um, but that's a serious thing that the organization is trying to achieve. So if I can um, do some performance work that directly affects, moves the needle on that KPI, then I'm doing my job irrespective of if I'm already the fastest website in the world. I think on that note as well, competitors don't need to be other businesses. Um, if you are genuinely the fastest 
business in your space. Um, your competitor is probably your website with none of the styles, none of the JavaScript. Um, that's like as fast as you could be to deliver the content, isn't yeah. it? Um, and I think that's always something you should aspire to be doing. It's like, if I was viewing this in uh, a Lynx browser that was built in, I don't know, 1992 or something, uh, would this load really quickly? Yeah. It feels like, you know, if you're already the fastest, then it's, it's what our CEO would call a high quality problem. Yeah. Um, I really like that expression. <laughs> that's such a, that's how I've imagined. That's exactly how I imagined it in the financial times to be. Okay. Luxury you. problems. Um, <clears throat> so I kind of, I have a question, but I'd like to share something with you as well. Go for it, yeah. Um, did you measure those, uh, like when you were taking, uh, measurements of these graphs, were you actually measuring, uh, the difference that it made from yesterday to today, or were you actually, because what we do is we basically take the user experience at that same particular time of the day and we deploy to different servers, yeah. different versions, yeah. so that we basically measure in between the two and we use the user experience and then the, the conversion rate and so yeah. on to That's compare nice. that same time frame of that same pool of users but hitting different servers with a different version of the, basically of the application. Yeah, so that's something we don't do at the moment, but I think that we will be able to do more easily in the future. Uh, our technical stack is uh, in the midst of being moved to the cloud, and that will give us um, a lot more flexibility to play around with those sorts of things. At the moment, we put change tickets in to do stuff on Stingrays, for example, our Stingray applications. So um, in the past, I've worked in organizations where I had a bit of access to the Stingray uh, things like do things in traffic script and do stuff between pools of servers, and that was cool fun. And, and uh, but it's been a bit more difficult at the BBC because of some of our infrastructure. So there are things that we're doing now that will enable us to do things like that in the future. But specifically for this work, we didn't do that. When we're looking at things that we've done, that well, we're not looking at things that we've done. We're looking at a blank screen. But we're, <laughs> were we looking at things that we've done? Um, Typically, you, you look in, in, you know, in Mbulse or something, the point that you released it, there's a cliff. If there's not a, a, a cliff in the graph, um, then, then it probably hasn't had very much Im impact. We haven't had anything that we've been trying to do that's of a um, uh, finesse of level that would, that would need to do. Um, yeah, we don't tend to do code releases when there's big news events breaking. Uh, but that's a good point. You're, you're absolutely right. And so there are, there are, I think there's good enough ways to do stuff and there's like really perfect ways to do things. And I think that you can create a scientific environment that's really, really accurate and, and everything's deterministic. Um, but if you're getting a really, uh, you know you're statistically getting something that's good enough to tell you what, where you're moving the needle, then that's, that's, that's okay. And so in this work, we felt that we've got good enough uh, at the moment. Hi guys, got a couple of questions around the, the ads. Um, does that create conflict a little bit in that you're generating revenue in the international business and not in yep. the UK? So does there get kind of more priority based on that? You mentioned that you know you focused on Perth improvement set. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so we we have um, different teams that will do work in different realms. Global News Limited is the BBC's international news arm, uh, and they live in. Uh, the new TV center, the new TV center, the old TV center used to be a big thing. It was kind of like a question mark shape. And there's like the dot of the question mark is what we've got left. And that's where uh, the which is TV center and that's where the GNL guys sit and they have their own developers. They employ uh, developers who work with us on our code base. Yeah. So um, we have a, a sort of internal open source kind of uh, system in play. Um, similarly for World Service, again, funded through a different pot of money. Um, uh, they have their own team within the within that within that broadcasting house where we work, uh, and they, they're kind of ring fenced. But we collaborate very closely. But we're there. There is proportions of resources. I, th I think probably at the business level, um, the domestic side of the business is almost blissfully ignorant that there are ads being served on the international yes. version of this website. Um, in a way, that's a good thing because they don't need to worry about it, and this all happens transparently. And sorry, second question on the, sure. uh, the ads as well. It's, I was working with a, another media company recently, and 
they did the same thing. They asynced their ads and then they found that they were spending less time on screen and therefore getting less revenue from them. Yeah. Did you get any analysis around that and any pushback? Uh, I, do, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think it's still <laughs> early days. Are, so <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty early days for us. So I've been involved in companies before doing a lot of stuff around ads and we had the same uh, situation, especially around the time of the ads and the AdWord networks now have brought in the kind of time on screen as a metric that didn't used to be the case. It was just hard impressions, but now um, are people buying uh, ads that are interested in, you know, I'm not paying for it unless it's been on screen for a second or three seconds. So I think as an organization, um, you have to focus on your, your users engaging with your site and enjoying being on your site and seeing lots of pages. Um, if they see five times as many pages, um, but I have half as many ad impressions, it's still making more money. So yeah, I don't know. I guess that is a thing. And it would be a legitimate thing for if Global News Limited wanted to go back to synchronous ads and people waiting 40 seconds and never even seeing a page in Bangalore or whatever, the consequences would be that, that I guess is their prerogative and they, they could do that. All right, we have to leave it there. Thank you very much. No problem at all. Thank you.